So I, it's my pleasure to introduce several folks from uh, Purdue's uh, Rose, Rosen Center for Advanced Computing. So we have Eric uh, Goff and um, Sam Weekly, as well as Brian Wertz, who are going to share with us their experiences uh, working with the composable platform Gettys, which is a uh, Rancher Kubernetes cluster and the use cases that they've supported for this resource. So go ahead, guys. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining. And, and thanks for uh, the opportunity to present, uh, present this work. So as an overview, we're going to start out just giving a little bit of context about our research computing group. We'll talk about our experiences with um, HEC systems uh, over the past uh, 20 years or so, and then talk about some of the new uh, transitions we've done into deploying these composable platforms. And you know, we'll try to walk the line between um, you know, not getting too technical, but we do want to talk about the technologies and the components. And we also want to highlight some of the use cases that we've seen in the past. Um, I think this has been up for maybe almost nine or 10 months now. So we'll, we'll cover some of, the, some of the use cases we've seen in the past. So first, just to think about, just to, to mention Purdue. So um, you know, we're a R1 university located in beautiful West Lafayette, Indiana. Um, there's a student population of about 50,000 and uh, about 12,000-ish of those are, are graduate students. And our department, which is uh, IT research computing or also RCAC, which is a, a, a previous name we've had, the Rosen Center for Advanced Computing. Uh, we're a unit of, of ITAP, which is the information technology uh, organization at Purdue. And what we do is provide advanced computing resources and services to uh, all of all the Purdue faculty and, and staff uh, that want to do research. And our goal is to sort of be like the, the one stop shop or one stop provider of choice for research computing and data services. So if you want to you want an HPC system, you want access to HPC, you would come to us and and be part of some of our programs as opposed to trying to build a uh, an HPC system in your lab's uh, closet or something like that. So that's our that's our goal. The way we've uh, the way we provided this service in the past is through the community cluster program, which is uh, an implement of the condo computing model. We've been doing this for about. You know, 17 years building centrally managed HPC systems. Research groups can buy into those for just the cost of a node. And there's a lot of benefits to that model. So people from ITAP, sysadmins, um, you know, they support the thing. So your graduate student isn't, you know, an expert in biology and also an expert in HPC. They can just focus on their research. There's low overhead in that we provide all the infrastructure for these systems and also the composable systems too, um, uh, networking and, and things like that, power. It's cost effective because we can leverage group purchasing power. Um, you know, Dell's gonna give you a better deal if you're buying uh, 600 nodes as opposed to, to six. And then compute nodes are shared among partners. So if I'm not using uh, the nodes I purchased, then other people can jump on those for a for a, a short period of time, uh, four hours, and and use those. So we can get more utilization out of the system in a in a, a community model like this. So we've gone from four partners in 2014 to over 200 partners, and a, a partner in this case is a research group, and we had about 3,000 active users in calendar year 21. Uh, there's some links. I can share these slides. Um, you can go there and kind of see what sort of HPC systems we're building. And this community cluster program over many years paved the way for us building Anvil, which is a new exceed uh, capacity system. Just went into production last month. And so Anvil is open for business um, through the exceed allocation process. But we're here to talk about composable platforms. So we'll, we'll kind of switch gears and, and see what 
uh, see what our experiences in HPC have have led to us realizing here recently. So that that community cluster model is is a reference implementation for Condo HPC. But what we see is that researchers come to us with these ideas or things they want to do that need more diverse computing resources. So they want cloud style flexibility. They might want to deploy a persistent service like a database, do some scalable data analytics with uh, something like Dask or Spark, or deploy an entire web-based science gateway and have it interact with our HPC. So a lot of these are either complementary services to HPC or some sort of elastic software stack that, uh, that can run in, uh, through, through some sort of scheduler. And these are these are sort of cloud applications, right? They would they would find a, a good home in the public cloud, and so why don't we just uh, you know make you know tell researchers researchers to get their credit cards and you know go to go to Google or wherever. So the problem with that is that it doesn't exist or it doesn't leverage the existing infrastructure that we have on campus already. You know we've got high speed networks and the large scale storage systems that people have their data on. The data is close, so they can. You know, use a, a local system to access their data uh, more easily. You know, if you go to public cloud, you're magically uh, become your own security team, and cloud can obviously be costly for for people who aren't familiar with it. So we want to get a path to go from campus to public cloud or some something like Jetstream, which is an exceed cloud platform. Um, but I don't think people need to go there first. They, they can have a, an intermediary step um, at the campus level. So the goals um, that we have are to create a campus ecosystem for cloud technologies. Um, people use virtualization in their labs on their laptops with Docker and containers. Um, we wanna share this technology, but also the knowledge sharing and support. We wanna empower faculty to integrate these cloud computing technologies in research and in their courses and instruction. So we'll see some of that in the use cases later. We, want to, we really want to give people the ability to deploy their own services. And they can do these uh, things that are very important for reproducibility, like version control. They can do automation and then also CI. And then evaluate a sustainable model for campus private clouds, the same way we've done with the, the community cluster program. So just Google platform, I think a lot of people maybe already you know, have an idea of what this is since you're, you're managing your own system that's like this, but we're providing access to a pool of resources. You can spin up portions of that resource however you want. Uh, and you can do this using DevOps principles and things like infrastructure as code, version control, uh, automation. This can lead to very portable applications that, are, that can be easily reproduced across platforms. So we're, we're saying this is a platform for PSYOPs and we can you know, apply these, de these DevOps principles to uh, computational and, and data intensive science. So one of the benefits that we get from, from this model is that I, I'm sure you've probably seen this with some, of your, uh, with some of your researchers is that in a traditional model, uh, you know, you've got the operations team, which is your, your group of engineers, and you've got your developers, which is maybe that's your science uh, people, your researchers, and the engineers will deploy something uh, like a, a Apache or uh, you know Tomcat or something like that, and they'll try to make that accessible to the developers to deploy their code or deploy a scientific application on it. And since the engineering team has root access, they've got the, the keys to the castle, and they don't want to give the developers that access you get into this situation where there's a lot of back and forth between developers and operations where I think we're not having yeah. a good connection for Eric. I don't know if Eric, you're able to hear us so you can potentially uh, shut off your video. I don't know if Brian or Sam, you're able to communicate with them or step in. Uh, yeah, 
I can probably just go ahead and step in until he gets back here. He hasn't messaged us on our Slack system or anything, so I can go ahead and take over. Yeah, go ahead. Yep. Give me one second here. Slideshow. Might have to catch up here. All right, yeah, is everything hey, I'm, good? I'm back. I He's don't know back. what happened there. Okay. Uh, I I guess the uh, we'll blame the wireless network here. Um, I can uh, I can share again if you want, Brian. That's... Yeah, yeah. Why don't you go ahead and share again? Sorry. Okay. Thanks for jumping in there, real quick. Yeah, not a problem. Um, okay, I think I'm I think I'm back. Can you see the the slides again? Again. Yeah. Okay. I it's funny, last time we gave a a, a workshop here, I got my, the power went out of my house too. So every time I talk about this stuff, uh, something happens. So, uh, yeah. So um, it, it's it's a platform that that people can use seamlessly, and they don't have to interact with engineering every time they want to do some make some little change um, to their system. So this is uh, this is sort of the vision for the the platform where you can uh, you know build a an image. Uh, that contains your software and the environment to run that. You can store that either in a public or private uh, registry. Um, you know, you can use Docker Hub, GitHub, or we have a, a, a private registry that people can access. You can incorporate version control there. And then you can deploy with uh, uh, our container orchestration systems, which we use Rancher to manage downstream Kubernetes clusters. So use Kubernetes to, to deploy the application, use Kubernetes to open up uh, API endpoints or uh, ports so you can access your application. And then Rancher provides um, you know, some feedback and monitoring through the, through the UI that can then uh, you know, maybe help you uh, streamline your application and then go back through this process again. So we run uh, three of these composable platforms currently. The first is a Geddes composable platform. And so we, we name all of our resource, all the resources we have after uh, uh, Purdue faculty or alumni that have um, you know, made an impact here at the university. So uh, the Geddes platform is named after Linnell Geddes, who uh, was department head of the School of Nursing here for many years. So this is our uh, uh, central community cloud system for general Purdue research use. And this one, you can do these supporting services we've talked about, you know, like science gateways that would interact with HPC, or you can actually do like the, the, the computing uh, on this as well. So deploy notebooks that, that run in the system, uh, utilize GPUs, uh, you know, run, some scalable uh, software stack like Spark um, inside the Kubernetes. So the remainder of the talk focuses on this impl implementation, but we also have the Anvil composable subsystem, which is, it's really an equivalent to the spin resource in my mind in that it's intended only to complement batch workflows that run on the Anvil HPC uh, system. Um, currently don't do um, large scale computing there, but in, maybe year two of the Anvil uh, project, we might try to incorporate Anvil compute nodes into the Kubernetes so we can scale out um, uh, data analysis workflows there. And we also have uh, the Archie healthcare analytics platform. So this is a specific uh, implementation for the Region Street Center for healthcare engineering that is, uh, that's HIPAA aligned. 
So I give it over to Brian to talk a little bit about um, the Geddes platform architecture and some of the technical details. All right, so I'll go ahead and start off with, uh, did you want to keep sharing your screen, Eric, and just flip through one? Yeah, just uh, tell me when to, okay. when to go forward. So I'll start off with giving a high-level overview of the Geddes platform. Uh, so for the physical compute, we are uh, leveraging Dell PowerEdge servers. Uh, AMD's uh, 7662 CPUs, and we have a small subset of uh, GPU nodes that are utilizing uh, the NVIDIA A100s, which we specifically picked uh, due to them having something called a multi-instance GPU feature uh, that I'll go into more detail uh, further down uh, in about two, two more slides here. Uh, for storage, we offer multiple types of storage so we'll uh, through Ceph. We'll have block storage, or we do have block storage, uh, file system storage, and uh, Ceph object uh, gateway storage. Uh, we also have multiple tiers of that storage. So we have spinning disk tiers, uh, SID SSD, and NVMe tiers uh, um, with those types. Uh, and so our Ceph is uh, uh, configured for all the replication and snapshots, uh, the typical things that you would see in a, in a, in a storage backend service that'd be able to, for uh, data integrity services. Um, we have software-defined networking that allows us to provision any type of addressing to whether that's private internal to the Kubernetes cluster, uh, private campus addresses, or public, publicly out on the internet. Uh, I believe Eric just alluded to uh, some type of integration with community cluster uh, integration is planned. Uh, we have a roadmap for this. This is something that we're currently uh, working on at this moment, but essentially we'd like to be able to dynamically add and remove nodes to the community clusters that we build uh, from our community clusters, uh, idle community cluster nodes. Um, so that's something that we'll uh, pursue in the future. It's not really something we're, we're looking at right this second. Uh, you can go ahead, next slide. For the, for the resources, uh, our physical Kubernetes, uh, physical Kubernetes uh, worker nodes add up to uh, 3,584 physical cores utilizing that AMD 7662 CPU. We have two subset uh, of uh, compute nodes that offer one terabyte uh, system memory and 512 gigs of system memory. Uh, our Kubernetes etcd and control plane nodes are physical servers, so they're not VMs. Uh, they don't have additional roles uh, associated with them. Uh, etcd has their own physical servers and the control planes have their own physical servers. Uh, for overall storage, we offer, uh, we have uh, 384 terabytes of spinning disk, 672 terabytes of SATA SSD, and 192 terabytes of NVMe, which um, as of right now, I think we have in the works uh, here pretty soon to add an additional one petabyte of, uh, of spinning disk storage uh, that my colleague uh, uh, Sam here will probably go over in more detail uh, later on. We have eight overall NVIDIA A100s, again, with the, with the MIG uh, multi-instance GPU feature enabled. Um, physical networking, we have 25 gigabit ethernet straight to the workers, 100 uh, gigabit ethernet straight to the storage servers, and two 100 uh, gigabit uh, aggregated uplinks to the core networks. Uh, we also plumb in uh, private and public VLANs that we utilize for uh, the load balance services that we deploy via MailLB that I'll go in a little bit more detail or showcase in the next slide or two. Uh, and our entire Kubernetes infrastructure uh, for Geddes is uh, stately, uh, statelessly provisioned via XCAT, which is the Extreme Cloud Administration Toolkit. I think I got that right. Uh, and uh, although the servers are com almost completely stateless, there are some stateful uh, 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 things to them that um, when they boot, there are stateful uh, partitions that are mounted via uh, drives that, and these are like the main Kubernetes directories to maintain that if we lose the entire cluster there, you know, we still get the same cluster when it comes back up, right? There's still some persistency uh, cross reboots, but for the most part, it's all stateless done through XCAT. And we were actually able to uh, get that down to a single compute image. Uh, so when we initially started, we, we didn't have stateless machines at all. We moved to a stateless environment where we had multiple images, and now we're able to we were able to get that down to a single compute image for the entire cluster. Uh, next slide. Uh, so we do utilize Rancher. We were talking about this earlier. Uh, Rancher runs on its own three-node Kubernetes cluster as an upstream cluster, and uh, from there, that cluster is used to provision all of the user uh, downstream clusters. So get us in this uh, in this situation, and or possibly others. We have uh, 
we have tested deploying a secondary cluster that we used uh, with decommissioned hardware just to test how to backfill uh, uh, workloads if that comes to a need that we need to uh, to test for. Uh, so we use a centralized authentication with Shibboleth, and that's tied into Purdue's two-factor authentication system. And the overall authorization is done and integrated uh, via something called Halcyon, which is our web-based cluster management tool. So the idea behind this is users will be able to go to our web-based cluster management tool and add and remove users uh, as they see fit to their projects. Um, they'll be able to opt in and buy in new, for new resources, so additional storage or, or memory within their projects, which then will be automatically provisioned via the API system of for Rancher. Um, we utilize Harbor uh, for uh, private and public registries internally to Purdue. Uh, so our idea behind this, you know, we, we learned pretty early on, almost instantaneously, that we have users that have images they don't quite want publicly available. Uh, so this gives us the means of being able to give them a private registry uh, means for their own their own groups and uh, bypasses the need of, you know, most of the solutions online for private registries cost some type of money. So this is a resource they get for free for buying in and opting in to the Gettys uh, Composable Infrastructure. Uh, and this is also where we house uh, Docker, uh, Docker Hub Cache. So we also learned pretty early on, uh, actually the hard way that uh, Docker Hub has rate limits to how many times you can pull images per six hours. Uh, I believe it's 100 uh, images per hour or per six hours. And after that, they they actually block it, the address that has pulled across that limit. So we actually ended up getting our enti entire NAT address pool uh, banned from Docker Hub at one point. So this is something that we had that we knew we had to implement and we actually did end up implementing. Uh, and Harbor is a really easy tool to use. It was really easy to do. And um, yeah, so Docker Hub cache on that end. For the Kubernetes configuration portion for our container network interface, we use uh, Canal, which is a mixture of Flannel and Calico for the network policies. Uh, and this is the layer that really helps us implement that, that rancher project level uh, isolation uh, between workloads. Um, we utilize Metal LB for our load, load balancing services. Uh, this is the portion I mentioned it earlier with the, the for the VLANs, uh, where people can deploy uh, pods to public or private addresses address space, depending on their use case. Uh, we utilize uh, K8's gateway, which is a core DNS plugin for ingress and our load balancer DNS records. Uh, so uh, user are users are able to supply any host name or any name they want for their application's uh, ingress, as long as it ends in the .get is domain. And uh, that DNS record will automatically be provisioned and uh, resolvable after that. Uh, the same thing with the load balancer DNS records. When you create a service, um, it'll create a DNS name in the format of service.namespace.get is domain. And that's automatically provisioned and resolvable when they, when they create those services. Um, next slide. Uh, so GPU deployment. Uh, so one of the things that helped us enable having a single stateless image for the entire cluster is uh, NVIDIA's GPU operator. So the uh, taking a look at the right side here, the illustration here um, really quickly, at the very bottom, we have our physical hardware level. Above that, starting with the software, the Linux, uh, Linux distro and the container runtime sections, you can think of those two gray sections there as our, our stateless image that we build uh, for the cluster. Uh, Kubernetes is on top. And then finally, we have the GPU operator uh, that is deployed specifically in Kubernetes. And this helps us manage all of the drivers and all of the, uh, the runtime container and, and monitoring associated with GPUs. Uh, GPU deployment, and it also helps us enable and configure uh, the MIG instances that I was talking about earlier. Um, this means that we don't have to do any of that uh, physically by building images with uh, predetermined versions and controlling all of the version control through the image builds. Uh, this is done through Kubernetes itself. Um, so I keep saying MIG, MIG uh, multi-instance GPU, if, uh, to clarify what that means, uh, it's a feature uh, via the A100s that allows you to take a physical GPU and segment it into seven separate instances of a GPU. Uh, and this really helps you bypass uh, the typical scenarios you might see where a user might be squatting on a, a, a GPU and only utilizing 10, 15, 20% of that, that entire GPU. Um, and we're able to segment the unused portions um, 
and distribute that to more users. So more users get their hands on GPU capabilities. Uh, we can better narrow down what actual GPU utilization users need for their applications. So again, do they need uh, this smaller profile or do they need this larger compute profile uh, for their workloads? Uh, we do deploy uh, MIG uh, in a mixed mode. Uh, this allows us to have more overall particular profiles of a particular type and kind of navigate through uh, the overall profiles we want to be able to provide for users or that users find that they need to be provided for them. Uh, and here, uh, on the left side here, we have a, a list of overall uh, GPU profiles that we have. So the one uh, one G point five GB, the one G represents how many compute slices are in that in that profile, and five GB is the overall uh, GPU memory that's associated with that. So overall, we have a total of thirty two GPU profiles, and compared to having eight physical GPUs, you know we we have eight physical GPUs that we're able to overall split into individual profiles and allow up to 32 overall users to have uh, GPU access now instead of eight. Um, and these numbers are easily changeable. Uh, if we find that the whim of, of GPU uses changes and we can we can associate um, and build new profiles for that. Uh, we do have a profile that's uh, the entire GPU itself. Uh, so we, we just because we can segment the GPUs, we definitely wanted to be in a situation where we are still able to supply full GPU capabilities to, to uh, to researchers if they need so. Um, and down below uh, is just a quick snippet of, of, of kind of how it how easy it is to actually opt in and, and pulling these particular GPU profiles. Uh, under resource limits, you just specify the tag uh, for that particular profile and how many of those uh, GPUs you want. And then under node selector, you would utilize uh, a label that is assigned via the GPU operator itself to determine that that physical node has has a G, actual GPU in it. Uh, and we do, uh, this is a bit nuanced and maybe out of scope, but we do isolate our GPU nodes via taints um, so that normal CPU workloads don't, if they're not utilizing the GPUs, don't spawn the GPU nodes uh, themselves. So um, I believe that's it for this slide. Uh, so security, uh, and I, I, I touched a little bit on most of these throughout what I just talked about, but we do have integration with the campus sign single sign-on, uh, role-based access control, again, through Halcyon, uh, and this is kind of left up to the users to decide who they want, uh, you know, access to their namespaces, their projects, uh, the resources inside their projects, um, and that's all managed via Rancher's API system via Halcyon. Uh, pod security uh, policies are in place to prevent uh, pri privileged escalation uh, in general, project level uh, network isolation that I had touched on a little bit uh, uh, through a CNI network. Uh, container security scanning via Harbor. So an additional feature to Harbor is it allows us to scan for vulnerabilities. Um, uh, we've used that once or twice already. And monitoring by our central computer IDS system. So a few years ago, we had built uh, a system called Pulsar. That is an IDS system that monitors all of the uh, research network uh, in and out of the research network connections, uh, which this uh, particular resource lives inside of. So we're able to uh, monitor that particular uh, means as well. And I believe that's it for me. I think that was the last slide. Yep. Pass it on to my colleague, Sam. Thanks, Brian. Um, so as Brian already touched on a little bit, uh, we provide a couple different tiers of storage in the Geddes system. Um, and obviously we, we target these for different use cases. Um, so we have NVMe, SATA disks and uh, spinning disks. Um, I guess something to note is, uh, so for us, the, uh, the SATA tier of disks exists alongside the compute workload. So those are available uh, on the same systems that we, we run uh, compute jobs on and other things like that. Uh, we keep the, the spinning disks and the NVMe tiers on nodes that are do not run workloads. So their primary, primary focus is on storage, uh, just providing users uh, with high throughput on that. Um, storage within the platform can be uh, either persistent or or empirical, um, and we additionally uh, have access to our central storage resources uh, inside research computing, uh, usually through Samba or 
uh, NFS mounts. Um, so kind of like Eric mentioned earlier, this, this helps uh, users who already have large data sets existing on our systems get easy access to that without having to copy data around or, or pay extra money to, to get their, you know, their, their data moved to wherever they're trying to do their work at. Uh, can you advance the slide, please? Um, so we provide all three of these using uh, Ceph, which we have deployed uh, using the Rook uh, provisioner. Uh, these provide block file and object storage, as we already mentioned. Um, and uh, a newer feature built into Rook uh, is giving the ability to control capabilities uh, and access control policies, as well as quota limits on the uh, object storage portions. Uh, we've tied that in Telcion uh, so that project managers are able to dynamically request or purchase more storage or provision it throughout their team differently. Um, so far, we've really liked Ceph and Rook. Uh, Rook has been really nice. It helps uh, prevent us from spending a lot of admin time on doing basic operations to keep the storage system up and happy. Um, it's also made upgrades and things significantly easier. Um, out of the storage services that we've offered, uh, a lot of users have opted to try out the S3 storage. Um, that seems really popular. We expect that when we expand our disaster recovery and backup cluster, that we will be adding more S3 storage to that uh, as more of a general campus resource to complement the users using these platforms, as well as provide that more broadly. Uh, can you advance the slide again? All right, so uh, for the application deployment, we, we've done some work uh, around Helm charts to provide some of the applications that researchers typically uh, need or want access to, uh, things like Jupyter Notebooks, uh, Spark instances, things like that. And one of the projects that we we, de we did was uh, working with the REU students. Um, we had two students from the University of Washington, uh, and they helped us develop a lot of these, we're calling them like one click or push button applications um, that are available in the GUI to users uh, who don't need or want to, to write their own code for things. Um, another benefit of this is it, it allows researchers to write applications that are, are, are custom to the cluster that their group is running uh, and provide an easy way to share that amongst their colleagues. Uh, next slide, please. Another feature that's in the system is the uh, horizontal pod auto scaler. Uh, and this is useful because we can watch deployments uh, for certain trigger mechanisms, like a certain percentage of, of CPU usage or, or RAM usage, and, and this can auto scale an application. Um, this is handy. We've seen instances, for example, where maybe a researcher has a, a small website that has been living on a, a random place for some amount of time and hasn't seen a lot of traffic. Um, and then say they go to a conference and do a presentation and suddenly 2000 people go and check out this website that, that has had relatively low traffic in the past. Uh, things like that are, are really useful because this auto scaler can see that load coming in and dynamically allocate more instances to help keep the service happy. Uh, and when you deploy with this, they're, they're typically done in replica sets. Um, so, so the application is aware of, of this being present. Uh, advanced, please, thanks. Uh, and so as Eric mentioned earlier, we've had this in production for some time now. Um, we had, we've so far as a, I should say, as a, a beta test system, as we, we move into production, so far we've seen about 60 users in 20 research groups. Um, of those 60 people, about 22 initially attended a workshop on the system and were really interested going in on on getting access to these resources. Um, additionally, we've demonstrated this uh, type of system uh, with the Anvil composable system. And we had also around 20 people in attendance to that during uh, PERC 21. Uh, with that, I think I will hand it back to Eric to finish off uh, 
on use cases? Yeah, so um, let me go over a few of the use cases we've seen um, over the past uh, over the past year. Um, so the the data mine is a uh, one of these residential learning uh, initiatives that that is happening at Purdue, where students are are introduced to data science concepts, um, and they they live in this uh, research based community. Actually, everybody lives in the same dorm room, and they have advisors and faculty visits um, to, to this particular residence hall. They also uh, interact with corporate partners to you know, cr create solutions to, to real world problems. Um, so the data mine has used Geddes to host Jupyter Hub and notebook deployments. Uh, these are used for, for coursework, uh, persistent databases uh, as well. So people can get um, familiar with interacting in it with a database for, for data science concepts and corporate partners so using this for the student projects. And what we see is that, um, you know, the corporate partners especially are, are using these technologies like Kubernetes, uh, you know, at their businesses. So when they come in and see that the students would have access to a platform like this to, to build up a web-based analytics platform or, or do data analysis, they, they tend to get really excited. Uh, and these Geddes resources are taught to, to many of the students who are, are, are taking part in this, in this community. We have a scientific solutions group uh, that develops CI, uh, mainly science gateways. They interact a lot with Hub Zero. They had an application called SwatShare that um, our engineering team was hosting in a, in a virtual machine. And if you think back to that developer operations thing I talked about uh, previous, this is the, this was that. So uh, Red Hat 6 VM managed by our engineering team Developers don't have a lot of access to it, and there was a lot of a uh, lot of back and forth. And they went through and redesigned this with containers on Geddes and migrating from this traditional deployment to a DevOps model. Um, I made everybody a lot happier. So they're just they go about their business now, and uh, they don't really have to interact with uh, with us that much, unless they have an issue with the deployment or something like that. The system is also integrated um, into our uh, CMS tier two analysis facility. So this is for uh, data analysis on the CMS experiment uh, at the LHC. We have SWAN, which is a notebook provisioner service and CERNBOX, which is data storage uh, and data sharing uh, integrated. So uh, CMS researchers can use Jupyter Notebooks to either scale out analysis on the Kubernetes or they can interact with our community clusters to scale out analysis there and also interact with some, some public cloud services. We have a group called Iron Hacks that uh, have developed a Kaggle-like platform for these virtual data science uh, hackathons and challenges. And they had a cloud-based platform that was running in uh, DigitalOcean that was providing this service. As the hacks got bigger, the data sets got bigger, and they needed access to you know, different, uh, uh, different computing, um, computing things like GPUs. Um, they found that their current cloud provider uh, couldn't give them those services. So they talked to us about incorporating the GPUs in Geddes to, uh, to do a, a hack that used more AI or ML techniques on larger data sets. Um, so they migrated their Jupyter Hub from the public cloud into Edis. Brian worked with them to integrate the uh, GPUs um, into the containers, and they will use this for a, a GPU-based AI hackathon in, in April. It's coming up, so we're excited to see how, how that goes. We also have some groups that are doing inference as a service uh, on this platform. So ARIO is the Automated Reconnaissance Image Organizer. And you could think of a reconnaissance team going out to the, the site of a natural disaster, taking pictures um, and sending these pictures back to 
a service that would automatically classify. And you can kind of see some of the, the different classifications that happen here. So image location, component type, damage level, and, and things like that. So Geddes can be used to expose API endpoints, the models that are doing this classification. And this was implemented, I think, sometime early on in the, in, um, uh, when, when Geddes was deployed. And they've done CPU-based uh, prediction and are going to switch to incorporating the GPUs uh, and the, the Triton server uh, sometime in the near future. And then this ARIO application that currently runs in somebody's, uh, on a system in somebody's research lab will be transitioned over to Geddes as well. So that's like the web, web front end uh, that can do management of the data sets uh, that, are, that are created. One of the things that's become maybe the most popular thing is, is this concept of a personal science gateway. These are uh, a lot of times deployed either using Voila or R Shiny. And what we see is that people want to provide access to data sets, but they also want to provide access to uh, some, to, to give the, a person the ability to do some sort of data analytics on that data set as well. So we we're combining an analytics platform with a data set and making it available via a, a URL in Geddes. And one of the main users of this is our, uh, our bioinformaticians from our cancer center core facility. So they would do an analysis. Um, they would provide a data set to the customer. And then there would be a lot of back and forth between the, the bioinformatician and the customer can you tweak this? Can you tweak this? Let me see what it looks like this way. And eventually they decided, hey, I can provide these things via our Shiny app and I can give the customer a data set and allow them to do all this, you know, this little investigation and changing of parameters themselves um, and kind of take myself out of the loop. So there's a, there's a real parallel there between the, uh, the bioinformatician and the customer and the engineer on our side and the customer uh, so it's kind of interesting to see that to see that pattern. So just some closing thoughts before we take questions. Um, I think we'll have a little bit of time for questions, which is good. On the operations side, um, it can be very easy to deploy things in Kubernetes, but the you know building your troubleshooting skills in this type of environment, a lot of the tools break down. You know, things you've been relying on forever, like ping, don't no longer make sense, and so getting your staff uh, uh, you know, familiar with the, the platform and familiar with how to troubleshoot the platform can, can, be, a bit of a, can be a bit of a challenge and, and some work needs to be put into that. This, this environment is rapidly evolving, rapidly evolving. Um, you know, often you do a Google search and um, you can get, the, the quality of your result definitely varies based on when it was posted. So, Sorting by date is good. GitHub issues are a great place to find information and it's very easy to, to delete things. Um, so keeping those etcd snapshots um, uh, somewhere else and, and backed up is, is definitely a good idea. And finding the right balance between flexibility and security in an environment like this can be difficult. Um, a lot of applications are written so people, so they expect, they expect people to have a, their own Kubernetes cluster where they have some sort of administrative privileges. And in our case, we have to, you know, clamp down some of that access because we're running a multi-tenant environment. So finding that balance is, is, can sometimes be a challenge. On the user support side, training is important. Providing tutorials and workshops is very important. And, you know, users will leave random things up um, and they, We'll forget about them. So it's good to sort of scan uh, what's running in your system and sort of take inventory of what's what's being uh, made available to to the the internet, um, especially. So we're trying to evaluate the Geddes cost model versus public cloud. So people would buy into this um, buy into this platform at uh, a subscription fee, which is three hundred dollars 
for a four core and 16 gigabyte chunk per year. And then we sell storage for $70 per terabyte per year. So we're trying to evaluate that cost model, model versus public cloud to see what sort of benefit we're, we're, we're giving the, uh, the reader. And these same capabilities are available in the Anvil Exceed resource. Um, so that's, uh, that's it. I'll, I'll just say thank you, um, especially to our early users and, and our team, and then also NSF. And then we'll have time for some questions.